Here are 10 challenges that depict increasingly difficult levels of multiplication. Let's start by multiplying two digit numbers. There are many ways to do this, but what I like to do is to put the 2 and the 1 on the left and the 5 on the 4 on the top. We will multiply each row with each column. So for example, in the first row and the first column, we multiply 2 and 5 to get 10. In the first row and the second column, we multiply 2 and 4 to get 8. In the second row and the first column, we multiply 1 and 5 to get 5. And in the second row and the second column, we multiply 1 and 4 to get 4. Now in the first row, the 2 really represents 20. And since we need to add one more zero, we're going to add one more zero in each of the individual cells. Likewise, since the 5 here really represents 50, we're going to add one more zero behind each of the numbers in these cells. Our final answer is nothing more than adding these four numbers which we can do with relative ease. Adding the zeros and the four gives us a four. Adding the eight and the five gives us 13 carrying the one over. Adding one and zero gives us one. And the number one simply equals the number one. This means that 21 times 54 equals 1134. This approach generalizes to multiplying three digit numbers. We put the 3 to 1 on the left and the 6 by 4 on the top. We multiply the first cell, 3 by 6, to get 18. The second cell to be 3 by 5, 15. The third cell to be 3 by 4, 12 and we repeat for each of the remaining cells. Looking at the first row, this 3 really actually represents 300. And since we're adding two zeros, we're going to add two zeros to each of the individual numbers. In the second row, the 2 really actually represents 20. So we can add one more zero behind each of the terms in the row. In the first column, the 6 really actually represents a 600, which requires us to add two more zeros in each of the terms in the column. Finally, the 5 really represents 50, and therefore we add one more zero to each of the terms. All that remains is to add up these numbers. Adding the zeros to the 4 gives us 4. Adding 8 and 5 gives us 13, carry 1 over. 1 plus 2 plus 6 gives us 9. 5 plus 2 plus 1 plus 1 gives us 9. 8 plus 1 plus 1 gives us 10, carry the 1 over. And finally, 1 plus 1 gives us 2. This means that 321 times 654 gives us 209,934. Can you try multiplying 5 digit numbers instead? If you tried it, the answer is pretty nice and you can let me know what it is in the comments section below. This idea extends really nicely to basic algebra. We want to find 1 plus t all squared. We can think of both terms as 1 plus 1 times t. This means we can put 1 and 1 on the left and 1 and 1 on the top. Multiplying each row and column gives us 1 in each entry. But in the second row, the 1 on the left really actually represents t. This means we can multiply t into each of the existing cells. In the second column, this 1 also really just represents t. This means we can multiply t to each of the corresponding cells. Since we have 1 1, 2 t's, and 1 t squared, the expansion of 1 plus t squared equals 1 plus 2 t plus t squared. But we can jack the nt up by a little bit. How do we find the cube of 1 plus t? We can think of this as 1 plus t times 1 plus t all squared. But we have an expansion for 1 plus t all squared. This is simply 1 plus 2t plus t squared. This is a multiplication of two polynomials, which means we can apply the exact same strategy, placing the 1 and 1 on the left and a 1, 2, 1 on the top. Let's fill in the cells by multiplying the corresponding numbers. And in the second row, the 1 really represents a t. This means that we can multiply t across the board. In a similar fashion, the second column really represents 2t. 
This means we can multiply t on each of the terms in the column. Finally, the third column really refers to t squared. This means we can multiply t squared across each of the terms in the column. That is precisely our expansion for 1 plus t all cubed. If you'd like to, you could try to find the expression for the fifth power of 1 plus t in a similar manner. Let me know your answer in the comment section below. Let's jack up the ante and multiply two polynomials. We can place the terms 1, 2t and 3t squared on the left, and the terms 4, 5t and 6t squared on the top. Here we're putting in the t's just to save some time. The first term is 1 times 4, giving 4. The second term is 1 times 5t, giving 5t. The next term is 1 times 6t squared, giving 6t squared. The following term is 2t times 4, giving 8t. The following term is 2t times 5t, giving 10t squared. And we can repeat the process, so on and so forth. Collecting the different powers of t, we're going to obtain this particular expression. But if we work with the special case t equals to 10, we can replace each of the t's with the corresponding number of zeros that follow a number. If we perform the calculation on the left, we actually obtain 321 times 654. And if we actually do the addition on the right, we obtain the exact same number that we obtained. So the multiplication idea really extends beyond just usual integers. Here's an interesting question. What is 1 minus t times 1 plus t? Let's line up the terms 1 minus t on the left and 1t on the top. Apply term-wise multiplication. Our final answer is 1 minus t squared. But a much more interesting question is, can we increase the powers of t on the right? Let's line up 1 minus t on the bottom and the different powers of t on the top. Let's perform our term-wise multiplication. And since most of the terms actually cancel out, we are actually left with 1 minus t to the fifth. In fact, could you prove the general case? This is known as a geometric series formula which is really useful in high school and in college calculus. This idea even extends to complex numbers. Let's consider the product of 1 plus 2i and 3 plus 4i. Let's not worry about i for now. Line up the 1 and 2i on the left and the 3 and the 4i on the top. Let's perform term-wise multiplication and the final cell would equal 8 times i squared. The number i is a really really strange number where if you were to square it, you get the number negative 1. What this means is that 8 times i squared really refers to 8 times negative 1, which simplifies to negative of 8, which simplifies to negative of 5 plus 10i. Could you use the same idea to prove the general formula for multiplying two complex numbers? Similarly, let's multiply 1 plus 2i to its conjugate 1 minus 2i. Let's apply term-wise multiplication, and the last cell equals negative of 4 times i squared. Since i squared equals to negative 1, this amounts to negative of 4 times negative of 1. This simplifies to positive of 4. We are left with the number 5. In fact, the more general result of multiplying a complex number with its conjugate holds. And we can even generalize complex numbers to four-dimensional numbers known as quaternions. Let's multiply the quaternion 1 plus 2i plus 3j plus 4k to the quaternion 5 plus 6i plus 7j plus 8k. Don't worry about i, j, and k for now. And apply term-wise multiplication. What are the rules pertaining i, j, and k? The first rule is that i squared, j squared, and k squared all equal negative of 1. This means that 12i squared amounts to negative of 12, 21j squared amounts to negative of 21, and 32k squared amounts to negative of 32. For the other terms, we're going to use this particular cycle that defines quaternion multiplication. Since the arrow points to k, 
14IJ really simplifies to 14K. Similarly, since the arrow points to I, 24JK simplifies to 24I. And finally, since the arrow points to J, 24KI really amounts to 24J. But now we're going to flip the arrow and all our answers are going to be negative from now on. What does that mean? Since the arrow points to J, 16IK really simplifies to 16 times the negative of J. Since the arrow points to I, 28KJ simplifies to negative of 28I. And finally, 18 times JI simplifies to negative of 18K. Adding up the terms with the same color, we're going to obtain this quaternion, which is as crazy as multiplication can get, including the easiest way to multiply two matrices in the video here.